Two or three no. places you have to hit go live. <laughs> no, it's not on. Okay. I think it might be coming up here real soon. Um, it says live on our little uh, camera that I'm looking at. So it usually takes I just a few seconds before it goes that. live on the yeah. real page. Yeah, we there we are. are. We are live. Woohoo! It works. It's a Christmas miracle. Excellent. <laughs> Well, Merry Christmas, everybody. Hi, everyone. This is Troy, Troy Klein. And I'm Rob Gutro. And Margaret. Yeah, we're having a little trouble with Margaret's voice. So Margaret has to say about four or five words, and then her suddenly it turns on her sound. So Margaret, every time you talk, you might want to say, hey, Merry, Merry Christmas. Hi, I'm Margaret, and then talk. <laughs> <laughs> Well, welcome Hello. everybody to our uh, our special Christmas time inspired ghost tracking group um, Facebook Live. Um, this is the first time we've ever done this. It is. Uh, it's COVID inspired, of course, because um, since we've been doing a lot of virtual things um, because of COVID nineteen, um, we've actually been able to reach out to a, a lot more people. Which so there's a benefit to that. Um, so. Um, I came up with this idea last. What was it last week? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And thankfully, Troy, who is the <laughs> technical wizard of the group um, with Thank Zoom, you. and right. and Margaret, the the manager, who is down there on my screen. But yeah, um, she's at the bottom of my screen too, where she should be. Hey, Margaret. Yeah. <laughs> nice <laughs> to see you down there. <laughs> 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 this is kind of like Hollywood Squares, I think. It is. Just kind of look down there at Margaret, like yeah, <laughs> way better. <laughs> so tonight we are uh, we're actually going to be talking about two two sides of Christmas the the bright side and kind of the dark side. So the, the bright side being spirits, and um, the spirits are the uh, energies of your loved ones who have crossed over, and they could be people or they could be pets and we're going to share a couple of stories about both of them and then after that we're going to talk about the darker side which is ghosts earthbound entities that yeah. uh, stay in the fixed location of their choosing and in this particular story um i think it's in my lessons learned from talking to the dead book um where uh i went to a, a theater in washington dc and encountered three ghosts of Christmas past and Troy went the next year and he encountered one of the same ghosts. So, um, that's going to be a pretty cool story. So with that, um, I hope you have your hot cocoa <laughs> and you have some warm socks and a, and a blanket because it's really cold here in Maryland tonight. Yeah, Temperatures going down in the twenties. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's um, right. So let me turn it over to Margaret first so she can say hello and tell everybody what Inspired Ghost Tracking is about and what she's doing the holidays. Margaret? So you're going to turn it over to me when I can't even talk or you can't hear me. Um, so I'm Margaret with Inspired Ghost Tracking. We have been together for um, 12 years now. And um, we do, we have a meetup group and then we have a core group. Our meetup group, we meet or try to meet in person because it's been very interesting. And um, we have a lecture every month and then we do an investigation, which is more like a public investigation. We go out to different places. Um, if we can find. The core group does the private investigation. So if you have something going on at your house, in your business or something, contact us and we will be happy to come see what's going on. Now, what am I doing for the holidays? Um, I am staying at home. Um, spending it with my family and all that and right after Christmas I'm going to see my daughter who lives in Virginia. 
So I'm um, gonna just relax a lot. I'm Back doing the same that. thing, Margaret. Yeah, I'm, I'm basically that. doing the same thing. Yeah, I'm gonna go stay here in DC for a while. And then uh, my sister lives in Missouri and they've been pretty locked down there uh, at her house because of my mother and being very careful. And then Jeff and I here in DC are very locked down. So I decided not to fly this year. The pandemic's out of control, <clears throat> which I just don't feel comfortable doing. And I did before, but and I was okay. But this time, uh, if I go, I'm going to drive, which is about 11 hours, 11, 12 hours. So I have like a lot of time to listen to these ghost tracking uh, shows and videos that we've done. <laughs> we need to make up a few more. I need 11 hours of content to listen to in the car. <laughs> well, see, at least we got something good during, you know, COVID. Yeah. Yeah, Ralph that's right. Has a lot of them on on his site on YouTube. That's true. That's true. Hey, Rob, I was going to ask you. The idea for this show is interesting to me to have a Christmas stories kind of uh, special, and because Christmas in the holiday season is is awesome for a lot of people, and then it's also awful and terrible for a lot of people because. Um, friends of mine, especially my, especially my dad had terrible, awful, uh, Christmases that he remembered growing up, uh, mm -hmm. in Southern West Virginia, they were in the coal camps and there was lots of, uh, just poor, they're extremely poor, but, um, apart, you know, the poorness wasn't what made it so bad. There was just a lot of stuff associated with where they lived and abusive situations and all kinds of stuff. So it took him years, even after he had the kids and we had Christmases at the house and I love it. Uh, the trees and all that stuff. He would get very solemn and kind of sunken down for a few days and he would have to pull himself out of it hmm. so he could enjoy Christmas with us. And eventually he did, but it took, it took years and years and years. So I would imagine that when loved ones pass or even hated ones <laughs> pass, um, that often messages come back from them sometimes to say, you know, I love you and I miss you and I'm here with you. And, which is one of the, the one story I have tonight. But the other is, you know, wondering about people who have stories of um, people who weren't so loved that were abusive or mean or awful or they didn't get along with who came back and gave them signs to apologize or say, I'm sorry, and I'm here with you. I wish I would have been better in life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's a hard time for a lot of folks. Um, and one thing that I've noticed throughout my entire life is that people tend to choose to pass around the holidays which makes it twice as difficult. That's so true. Um, as a matter of fact, um, my husband, Tom, um, his father passed uh, the week before Christmas. And Ed, um, his, uh, his late partner, who is, the, who is the subject of my book, Kindred Spirits, this, this book, um, he passed on December 19th. So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dedicate my part of the show to Ed because he's, oh, nice. he's always around. Um, but it, it is a very difficult time, but everybody needs to know that their loved ones do come around at Christmas. So, so birthdays, anniversaries, and holidays tend to be the big times that they come. And and the reason they do that is just because that we do that in, in life. Um, so people on the other side understand and maintain those holidays in their memories, and they show up to let us know they're still around, so. Well, that makes sense because uh, like with my grandparents, for instance, we saw them, you know, several times in the year, but we saw them for like two weeks at, at one time, every holiday, every Christmas, I mean. <laughs> so a lot of my memories are of seeing them around Christmas time and in the house. And that is the way that they came back and were able to connect with me afterwards was through those memories. So, Margaret, did, did, you, did you ever have any experiences around Christmas time that you could put your finger on? I did not. Okay. Is it because you have kids running around? <laughs> yeah, I've had live ones, but not um, ghostly. Okay. All right. Well, Troy and I will share our, our, our spirit experiences. Yeah. Um, so, um, I, I'm going to tell you about a... Uh, the spirit cat first, and then we'll get into the humans, and I'll turn it over to you, Troy. Um, okay. Yeah. Just to, because there's so many people that that have pets that are on the other side, um, and um, for those of you who don't know, I wrote Pets in the Afterlife one and Pets in the Afterlife 
2. And uh, Pets in the Afterlife 3, by the way, is coming out in January. Awesome. Yeah, it's got Dolly and Franklin on the cover. Oh, my, that would be kid, awesome. Yeah, they, my kids had just passed this year, two of them. So It was Dolly um, that came to the kitchen, right? Was it, No, it was Frank. Which one came to my kitchen, Sprite? And that was Sprite. Oh, okay, okay. All yeah, right. so uh, so Troy has actually... <laughs> that, was, that was interesting. <laughs> Troy has been contacted by three of our dogs this year, <laughs> Sprite, Franklin, and Dolly. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and, and Troy, I, uh, y your encounter with Dolly and Franklin is part of the chapter in... Oh, is it? Chapters oh, that's in awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope it helps somebody because often uh, you know people might miss the signs that if you're just not, you know, like uh, being intuitive in, in different ways that we are, it's like a muscle, really. It's a spiritual muscle that if you exercise it, you work it, you work out spiritually, you test it, uh, and you're in situations where you're asked to do that. It gets better and better and better and actually it, it it gets stronger relatively fast when i started with the group 10 years ago or however long ago it was uh i'd had many experiences but nothing that was as intense as it grew to be after being in situations where you guys just threw me right into the river so that it was sink or swim at that point and i it was funny because uh i jumped the first ep, the first experience was you know double murder investigation and that was my very first one and so <laughs> and i didn't know anyone and i thought i'm going to show up and nobody's going to be i'm going to just make it's i'm just going to be making up all this stuff and who cares it'll be fun and you know, i'll get a kick out of it if it's way off and they tell me no no they tell me a parakeet died and you made up this double murder thing and so when i got there and i realized the the puzzle was around you especially i tend to my gifts amplify when i'm around other gifted people somehow for me and uh, it, it turned into an experience. And the thing that freaked me out was um, they had somebody with me that had a notebook and another person with a recorder. And I'm like, I didn't know you were going to do that. I mean, you're actually going to track what I say. <laughs> and then I'm like, they're going to be sitting around laughing their butts off by the time this is over. And then by the end of it, I was never so amazed in my life how accurate uh, you were and how accurate what I said was. I mean, yeah. it validated the, the gifting it just and i never expected that i really didn't so neither did i important. <laughs> i know right I, seriously and then uh so i'm saying all of that again just to say that for people who miss their loved ones or have a hard time around the holidays this is a really good show to listen to especially rob's experiences because if you start picking up on certain telltale signs and things you might not have thought of you thought it was just coincidence and all that it's actually your loved ones, your pets, and your animals trying to connect with you. And they probably have been for years. So I'd say listen up. Rob has some good tips and tricks for us today. <laughs> Thanks, Troy. Um, <laughs> sure. So, uh, so by the way, if you, anybody wants to read about the double murder ghost investigation, which was really a gruesome, crazy, detailed investigation, it's right here in Case Files of Inspired Ghost Tracking, Volume 1. So there yes. will be Volume 2, by the way, Troy, because... Margaret and you and I and Rhonda and the rest of the group have a lot of cases that we've been on and um, we do yeah I but, cannot wait for the vaccine to be out and the pandemic to be over I'm dying to get back into these houses and well and helping people don't, don't yeah. say dying <laughs> well one day I mean none of us are getting out of this alive that's my well favorite. that's that's true <laughs> So I'm going to talk about pets for a minute. Um, so pets, like people, uh, come around on on holidays, like Christmas, uh, because what they do is they sense our energy level. They sense our emotional energy. And emotional energy is something that if you have a pet, and Troy, you have a cat. I have two, yeah. We have two cats. Um, we have two dogs. Uh, Margaret, you have a dog. I have a dog and a cat. They're not mine, but they're in the house. But they're in the house. So, so we're all pet parents, um, yeah. and we know that if, you know, if we come in the house and we're sad, our pets will come over and pay attention to us. If we're feeling sick, they'll stay with us, usually. Um, if we're angry, they'll go in another room. <laughs> they don't want to deal with it. <laughs> right. um, <clears throat> so they read our emotions. They read our emotional energy. And as such, when, during the holidays, usually our emotional energy is elevated. So in usually in a good way, um, and so they like to come around and visit. They don't really understand what a holiday is, but they understand our emotional energy levels. So, so with that, 
Um, uh, I, I, I will tell you that our, our docs in Franklin just visited oh, wow. the other day. Now, Franklin passed away in May. Um, he was 16 years old and um, he had a slip disc and, and we had to make the choice, which is the most awful thing that you have to do as a pet parent, but it's also the most humane thing. So um, Franklin gave a number of signs when he, the first week that he passed, and then we hadn't heard from him because Dolly passed. And then Dolly has been giving signs like every day or every other day. Um, Dolly's our Weimar honor. Um, so last weekend, it was last weekend, Tom and I were outside in the backyard and uh, we were, the two dogs, our two dogs were there. Um, and I was sitting on a chair. We, it was like 65 degrees outside. So we, we were pretending it was summer in, in December. And <laughs> I distinctly heard Franklin's bark coming from the sun porch. And he used to do that. He used to bark when he wanted to go out. So, um, after not hear, hearing from him from, I don't know, a couple months, um, suddenly we heard, I heard his bark. And I realized, oh, it's Christmas time. He just wants me to know that he's still around. Um, my friend, um, a friend of mine in, in California uh, wrote me and she told me that she, ha she was a cat, she's a cat mom. And she said that she had a heavy blanket on and <clears throat> she felt a pressure on her feet that and she actually saw the blanket go down wow on top of her feet and she wanted to know who that was or if it was somebody she said it just won't naturally do that so i tuned in and i said it's a black and white cat that passed and i i couldn't remember the name of her cats um i've only met her once so and that was a couple years ago um but I said it was a black and white cat, and she said she knew exactly who it was. And she said, "Well, why would my cat come?" She said, "It's not his birthday, and um, it, it's not the anniversary of his passing or his adoption." And I said, "Because it's Christmas." Uh, so, you know. so our and they know you need home. them, you know. Yeah. I think they're very in tune with your feelings uh, on the other side and know when you need them. And that's the same with humans and all of it. I know through people when they're in a crisis, going through something awful, or there's a special time and you're feeling alone uh, or isolated or something that often that's when these, when your loved ones and your animals will show up, it sounds like. Yeah, so so Troy, I'm gonna turn it over to you so you can tell us your yeah. Christmas. Uh, Mine is, you know, most of my stories happen at just random different times of the year. And uh, it, they happen often for me around birthdays and anniversaries of deaths and things like that. Uh, but my grandmother passed first on my mother's side. And I think we may have lost Rob for just a little bit. He'll be back hopefully here in a little bit. Lost his video. No, anyway. I wanted to put the focus on you. Oh, well, well, thanks because you put the focus back on you by turning your video off. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. Totally. Um, I like talk. I like seeing a face when I'm talking that way. Yeah. I don't talk to you that way. All right. I'm not telling a story. So I'm not talking Bing. to myself. There we go. Back. I'm glad. All right. It's the magic of Christmas. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm actually looking at the two of you while I'm talking. That's why it feels so good. Like when I'm here at the house, I can see okay. you. Um, so my grandmother has been incredible on my mother's side about uh, connecting with me and my mother um, because there was a whole long story I've talked about before. It was during the years years ago when I was first coming out and my family is extremely religious. My dad was a minister and, you know, I was a pre preacher's kid my whole life and my sister as well. So, but my, my grandfather was also a minister and my grandmother was a minister's wife and my mom was a preacher's kid. So it's like two to three generations back. And so my grandmother, when uh, I came out to my mom, my mom flipped out entirely, you know, like I died and all those fun things. And she, and my dad uh, was, had was really good about it and uh, that surprised me but he was he was really strong and resolute about it my mom struggled and struggled for a long time until uh she had a dream and in the dream my grandmother um came back to her and she said uh my mom said that she walked up and she saw my grandmother's the perfect little house that she and my grandmother would talk about when they were when she was a little girl about the perfect house they'd love to live in 
little white picket fence, flowers in the front, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. She said in the dream, my mother said she walked up and there was the house and my grandmother was making this whistling sound she always made when she's cooking or working. And she was working in the flowers and she turned around, I was like, oh, Linda, hey, it's good to see you. And, uh, and mom said, hi, mom. And she walked up to her and she goes, oh, there's somebody here to see you. And it was my grandfather who came out of the house and said hello to her and he had just passed. And then uh, she said, oh, there's somebody else. And it was my voice, but I never came out of the house. I, and mom said in the dream, that meant that uh, I was still alive. That wasn't that I was passing yet or anything like that. But my grandmother said, there's somebody here that needs to say hi to you. And he's, he's okay. He's just fine. And when she heard my voice and it was me, she woke up with this knowledge that Troy's going to be fine. This is actually okay. This is not the end of the world. And it was my grandmother's way of speaking to her in symbolism that it was a serene place, the place they always loved. She was jolly with me. I was fine. And it turned, it was a turning point for my mother. And then I had a dream with my grandmother right around the same time. We stitched it together later. And my grandmother, uh, we were, my family and I were at a hotel on a road trip or something in the dream it was like a motel so there was a uh, elevator outside and everybody in the family had rooms on the bottom ground floor mine happened to be up on the second floor so i jump in the elevator and my grandmother steps in and she's stately and stronger than she was in life and she just looked at me with a serious and kind face and she just said you know be patient with your mother and and then i woke up you know wow. that was it so i I was because I was angry. Uh, I was really angry. The fact that I was being honest with my family about this, the people I love on earth, like the sure. most. and I felt really betrayed that I was honest with them. And then, and a lot of people do, they get kicked out. All terrible things happen. None of those things like that happened to me. And I'm so glad they didn't, but I was afraid they would. So all of that happened that leads up to this quick and small, but powerful moment for me. I was in uh, uh, just the safe way in uh, Georgetown uh, several years ago and I was just walking through and you know picking up stuff whatever and I got to the fruits and vegetables section I'm moving around I suddenly just felt my grandmother and my grandfather especially her uh, with me so much so that I just kind of stopped and I could just sense her like really I can feel her with me actually while I'm speaking <laughs> she just moved up I can feel her right here with me right now Thanks. Awesome. that's really cool I'm glad she's here she loves the story too hand on my shoulder <laughs> she's gonna make me cry this is crazy this oh make me cry <laughs> but uh she she amplified the smells in that store and i started smelling apples and bananas and oranges and that particular combination and it was really strong and then i remembered all of the Christmases before when they would come to our house because my dad was a minister and there was a church thing going on the week before they would make, uh, we would be in there with all the, all these people and women of the church and men and guys and kids stuffing fruit baskets for two, 300 people of like bananas and apples and oranges. Oh, okay. And they, that was in all the bags and baskets that we made. And that smell was so strong. Like every Christmas, that's what I smelled a lot of. And my mother used to put orange peels and things like that on the stove. So it would smell the whole house up. And it was just her way of reminding me that she was with me and that she was there. And her way right now reminded me that she's here with me right now. So that's a real special thing. But I, what it is, is often people, when you have a little experiences like that, uh, don't discount that in any way. It, it, takes, it takes effort and a lot of love for people on the other side to be able to manifest something whether it's a smell, a memory, a thought. And they do that because it's special and they, they want to connect with you. And every little time they do in any way, whether it's a penny you find on the ground, a ladybug that flies through or a dragonfly, uh, embrace it. It's a hug from the other side. And uh, I, I talked to my sister about those kinds of experiences. And especially when my father passed about four years ago, and as you both know, that was devastating for, mm -hmm. it was just, a devastating thing yeah and i remember getting a real sense of dad he would show up once in a while and he showed up a lot with my mom and my sister in some really beautiful uncanny ways i mean it was just like wow but every time he did we would just break down and we miss him so much we just start crying because of the love that just wells up all at once you just hardly can control it and it dawned on me i, I think he shared this with me but it went through my head in one of those experiences i said 
you know, you don't want your, you don't want, you don't want to give your dad the wrong message. Basically you're crying. He doesn't want to come back every time he comes back and he, he's with you and you feel him mm-hmm. and you fall apart and cry and you go into grief. He might stop coming back for a while because yeah. he doesn't want to induce that pain yeah. in you. That's not his point. And if you want him to keep coming back, and you need to be able to say, you know, welcome it, take it like a hug and be happy about it. You can cry, you can, you know, like a reunion, it's okay. But the grief part where you're just so stricken with grief that you can't embrace the love and the hug they're trying to give you at that moment can become a, a block uh, for a lot of people. Sometimes grief can really shut down your ability to connect with people in lots of ways that are trying to, to connect with you. So we talked a lot about that, my sister and I, and we think about it every time I feel him or a loved one or any of those things, I, I really do intentionally think to them or I speak it out or I'll think it, um, you know, my crying and one of my feelings are here to embrace you. I love you. I miss you, but please don't be afraid or in any way, don't hold back because I'm being, I'm having an emotional experience right now because I love you that much. And please come back as much as you need to. I, I do know that if you are scared by your loved one in spirit, they won't come back because that happened to my mom. Yeah. After, my, after my grandmother passed, my grandmother whispered my mother's name in her ear and my mother was totally horrified, petrified. And my grandmother <laughs> never came back to my mother again. Would you? I mean, if you were on the other side and you whispered into your loved one's ear that you want to say hi to, and they freaked out, I mean, yeah, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't do it again. But, um, but so fear will likely convince them not to come back. But I think being emotional and and maybe and crying and so forth really shows the the care and the the love. So they will be more inclined to come back, even though they know it makes you cry. It's it's kind of happy tears. So. It can be. And I think what was happening with us, with my dad, was that it wasn't happy tears for a while. It was grief. No. It was utter, just that unhealthy place that you go if you stay there. Like, it's okay to cocoon and go to the depths of grief and explore the whole realm, uh, but you can't stay there. And, you know, it, for for me, um, you know, I, I love my dad so much that it he was a big part, a big anchor in my life and still mm-hmm. is. Yeah, but not having him physically here was a massive life change for all of us, and we had to get used to that. And you know, we are—we want him back, but um, I'm, we're actually in a place now that I—he should be just fine to come back. You know, and, and anytime he wants him to say hi and hug us and all that, just like my dog Pete uh, comes back from time. He just came back. Uh, my dog. I think it was last week I was talking a little bit about him and I could suddenly boom, boom, the tail wagon and all that. I could feel him and sense him. He ran around and then he was gone. I'm like, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. That, um, and, and that chapter that you wrote for, uh, yeah. my, my, this one pets in the afterlife one yeah. about your experience with Pete was, is yeah. really moving. So, um, I love that story. Yeah. Yeah. I read that story, especially if you've lost an animal that you feel guilty about their passing. Uh, I felt I carried guilt for years and didn't even know it until Rob and I talked about it. And it was because Pete was able to come back. I was with Pete every Christmas, every holiday, every, every day of my growing up life. And so he was an integral part for 12 years of my childhood, which is an eternity, especially when you're a kid and you get an animal when you're six or seven years old. Sure. And then all, you know, and you go your whole existence and it feels like, 90 years you know until you become an adult finally uh it's life is a lot longer in those days uh and so that was a long time to have him with me and then he was gone but now i really celebrate his spirit his energy i celebrate my dad's spirit and his energy too Uh, my sister gave me a beautiful picture of him of the night sky the night my dad uh passed Hmm. and i was in west virginia and i went to the place where we had to go deal with everything that had just happened and i remember walking out of this cabin where he passed and i walked out and looked up and it was this brilliant night sky the milky way was out it was powerful and i i'll never forget feeling him in the stars i mean his very presence and essence was just strong when i all throughout the stars and i don't fully understand that uh even as a intuitive person and all of that i i know our energy becomes one uh, it seems with the universe and with all things, but yeah. there's still a consciousness, an identity of who we are, 
that's also there that's very strong we're just there's no body to contain it apparently we are these gigantic unlimited creatures uh, in spirit uh, it would seem and then right now we're having this physical experience where it's all being contained in this little tiny body uh, for a period of time for whatever yeah. reason so when it releases people often talk about how they just feel expanded and just huge and you know just start becoming part of everything they rise up out of their bodies in the room and they're just like this giant they can see all around the building and other rooms all at the same time it's a ball just of energy that thing. defies physics i think it really really does it yeah does. but yeah that's that's a quick story but it was a special one for me uh, with grandma my grandmother so every once in a while i'll still get the i'll, I'll connect to people through uh often most often it'll be smells I often mm -hmm. sense people come up to my right or my left side, just like someone physically comes up. It's the same feeling. And uh, also, and some, there's been a handful of times, there have been a handful of times where it's been auditory, like you were talking about with the dog, you heard the dog bark. Um, I've heard my name called in the house, physically out loud called in the house, probably four or five times throughout my life. Wow. You know? Yeah. It's That's... like I, to the point I got up and looked for who I, I knew whose voice it was, but I'm like, well, that person can't possibly be here. But I got up and looked anyway, because I'm like, there was somebody in my house who just yelled my name. It sounded like my mom or sounded like Jeff or sounded like whatever. And what's interesting, Rob, is I told you before, often I don't know, it's hard for me to discern the difference sometimes between the living and the dead when I'm picking up energy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And some like one time I heard Jeff's voice and it's often because he was, my husband because he was thinking about me or something and i heard you know troy like really loud in the house which means i probably should call him or find out what's going on mm -hmm. uh, but you know like when we've been on investigations i'll be in there and they'll ask me to are you picking up on our relatives and things like that and i sometimes yes sometimes no i can't just make it happen for me some people yeah. are great and can do that but uh i was describing a old gentleman i said he's wearing bib overalls he has this t-shirt like a flannel type shirt on as he's frail he's probably this tall probably 78 he's got you know the hair and how short it is and a shuffled walk and suddenly the door opens and in walks this man that i just described it freaked me out and it was their grandfather he just wasn't dead he just showed up and had been walking up the driveway as i was picking up his energy and, oh my gosh yeah, that was at that house where the lady gave us the plants because we were able to and the ouija board was in the house it was that house. yeah that was crazy and i'm like okay i can't tell the difference anyhow but i want to hear your stories rob that's that's kind of a big setup for the little one i have but i know you have some really good ones well, there, well there's some interesting ones um so uh and last week i i got another Christmas spirit visit. Um, not 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 me personally, but um, an old friend of mine that I've known since I was a teenager. Um, he called me, and I haven't, you know, in this day and age, we've been texting and messaging and all that stuff. We haven't heard each other's voices in I don't know, maybe seven, eight years, I guess. Oh wow! Yeah. So, um, so he sent me a message, and he said, "I'm freaked out. There's something in my house." Oh boy. So so. Um, <laughs> I, I just sent him a reply, and I and I was able to connect and figure out who it was, and, and he called me. He said, I, I didn't see you reply, and I'm, I'm calling you because I'm freaked out. And I said, well, you, <laughs> you checked your messages, but <laughs> um, I, wound up I, I wound up talking to him, and it turned out to be his mother. Okay. Now, um, I... I I had some recollection that his mother had passed like 20 years ago. Now, I, I moved from Massachusetts 25 years ago, and I knew him in Massachusetts when I was a teenager, which was a lot longer than 25 years ago. But I'm not going to talk about that. Um, but so uh, so I knew she passed, but yeah. um, and, and his dad passed long before, before his mom. So he said to me, well, how do you know? And I said, well, I'm connecting to your energy and then connecting to the energy in your house. And okay. I, I said, so So he explained to me what happened. He said he and his husband have candles that are on, I guess they're battery lit and they're on timers and they all go out after like five hours at night. And he said over the past week, one candle would stay on 
in different rooms on different nights and he couldn't explain it and and he said finally <laughs> he said the reason he called me that day was he and his husband got up and they know that they unplugged the christmas tree but it was fully lit when they got up oh my and gosh and then it was some, unplugged yeah he, yeah and so oh God. he said he thought he, someone was in the house and then he yeah. said as soon as i walked in and i saw that christmas tree lit there was like a shadow of a person an outline that ducked behind the tree oh wow and he said he freaked out <clears throat> yeah well yeah he thought, he thought it was a ghost Which, yeah. so I, I'm uh, too. <laughs> so he said why would why would my mother come around? And I said, well, it's Christmas. Your mother wants to let you know that she's around at Christmas. And and I said, I can explain the candle thing, too. <clears throat> she she uh, pr let, lit one candle in different rooms to ensure that you saw it and understood she was there. But that wasn't good enough for you because you didn't get the message. So she yeah. had to light the Christmas tree. Yeah, I wonder if she was the one who used to light it and turn it on and put it up and all that stuff in his life. Yeah, that he was did. her role. Yeah, he did say that she did that. Did yeah. he? Yeah, oh, that makes total sense. That's look at you beautiful. tuning in. Uh, I, yeah, it's crazy, Rob. When I'm around you, I swear it's like off the charts. And uh, somehow with COVID, um, being in the pandemic, I guess there's more time to be less distracted by so many other things. I'm noticing that I'm way more. I'm, these i'm way more intuitive and picking up things than I, w I was before and i'm really happy about that mm -hmm. um but i've also had to be very careful with that have you had the experience of having to really protect yourself and tune out all the what you're like empathically i'm picking up the energy and the fear and the concern and the political climate and the covid climate and the, all of it um and it's overwhelming to a lot of people people who are intuitive and don't even know it it's a nightmare for them because they think it's their own it's all their own stuff yeah. And you're actually picking up the emotional energy of your neighborhood. Yeah. Um, so I've had to be really careful there, but I think it's also opened the door for us to be a little bit more tuned in, which I think is a one silver lining. So I want to ask Margaret, um, Margaret, have you, I know that you, you can be sensitive at times, mm -hmm. right? So have you felt a change in emotional energy this season? Um, yeah. I have, um, and I think more towards like at the VFW, I have felt a whole lot of emotional energy. Um, so it's like, and my emotions were going all over the place the last week or so while we were there. And Me too. so um, we were closed on Wednesday night and Ryan, my um new bartender he says i think that um there's somebody here with us and i said well why do you say that he yeah. says well the men's bathroom from the hall side the door open and closed he says oh, there's gosh. one here but me and you and i said well that's something that happens quite often <laughs> so yeah you yeah. have met or or have had an experience from our um spirits that come in here yeah rob's gonna have to write a book about uh you know ghosts in the bathroom <laughs> yeah we can talk afterlife. about ghosts in the bathroom <laughs> i don't want to so go many there times right there are experiences where ghosts appear in bathrooms it's... i don't want to go there right now <laughs> no, no, maybe it's because there's water in there i don't know yeah <laughs> people talk about how there's they'll be in the shower and, and they'll have an experience or they're in the bathroom or they'll the ghost is there like we had that before so anyway sidetrack yeah. yeah how about that so, so Margaret, you, you have uh, so you have spirits seeking spirits <laughs> so to speak in the oh. at the bar Boom, boom. I'm here all week, twice on Thursday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it makes sense too that they they would come around <clears throat> at Christmas oh, yeah. time because there's there was probably Christmas parties at the VFW, right? It was a social place. Yeah. Well, we used to have Christmas parties, but I think right now it's also the fact of them shutting us down. Yeah. <clears throat> so I think yeah. they were popping in, knowing that nobody was going to be around for Christmas. I wonder if uh, 
like like places that are active like where margaret works the vfw is a very active ghost place um several investigations have been there i wonder if when a place shuts down for whatever reason for let's say weeks of time or months um if it kind of charges it back up i wonder if the spirit energy is able to feel a little bit more comfortable many of them coming back in and really being there um and i don't know i've wondered because often you go into an old abandoned house the place is haunted like crazy and then there are a couple investigations and it's all gone you know they they just shut down Sure. Uh, after a while, it doesn't always happen, but it can. So, so that would be a spirit, anyway. I would, I would believe, unless you're talking about the resident ghost that still haunts the VFW. Do you think it was the ghost? No, I think most of what's in there is spirit. Okay, because people look back and visit. Okay. Yeah. I think you're right. I think that's what I sensed when I was there too. Yeah, well, the older members that just, you know. It's like they're a second home. So being there is just like, you know, going to their house. Yeah, it is. Isn't that an old Tracy Lawrence song, country song that says my, my second home and talk about being at a bar? <laughs> <laughs> I believe it. I'm dating myself. That was from the 80s, but <clears throat> yeah. You were born in the 80s? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> 1985. Yeah, I yeah, you know I sketch in wrinkles to look more. Uh, I do the same thing. I want people to take me seriously, so <laughs> shave my head and put on some wrinkles. You know. So yeah, so speaking of aging, let's talk about ghosts. Let's talk about our ghostly. Uh, <laughs> this is my poor attempt at a segue. Um, oh, okay. So. <clears throat> The, uh, the ghost that we're going to talk about is a ghost that both Troy and I encountered uh, in the same place, of all of, of all things, but in different years. I think it was one – you were there the year after I was there. Yeah. So in December 2010, <clears throat> um, I went to the Forge Theater in Washington, D.C. Um, the Forge Theater is uh, – it's actually a, a very infamous theater, really, because that's where John Wilkes Booth assassinated President Lincoln. John Wilkes Booth was an actor and a Southern sympathizer, <clears throat> and um, he went up to Lincoln's President Lincoln's uh, uh, box, if you will, um, theater box, and and shot him um, with a pistol in the in the back of the head. Um, and Lincoln died across the street. Lincoln's body was taken across the street where he passed away. Um, John Wilkes Booth um, escaped. He um, he ran out the side, uh, I believe it's the side of the theater, and jumped on a horse, and he went to Southern Maryland with uh, somebody else, and I can't remember who that was. Maybe you guys know who it was. Um, but he went to Dr. Mudd's house, um, Samuel Mudd, um, who fixed his, treated his leg. Now, uh, now, Margaret has been to Samuel Mudd's house, <clears throat> quite a few times and um, before I go on with the story I want to just go to Margaret again because Margaret there's a famous picture that's in uh, case files and inspired ghost tracking that I think somebody somebody took on the team and I can't remember who it was was it Rhonda? Rhonda took it yes can you tell everybody what the picture is? Um. We believe the picture is Dr. Mudd. So Dr. Mudd was, so people were doing investigating on the first floor and it looked like a male shadow figure on the stairs. Is that correct? So we were doing, well, we were doing an investigation in the whole house. Um, but we were coming down the steps and right on the, when you come down the steps, um, there's a mirror. And Rhonda stopped at the bottom of the steps and took a picture in the mirror. And it okay. reflected back to the steps. And there he stood right there on the steps. Now, we oh. ended up on my ghost story about that picture and about some of the stuff that we captured at Dr. Mulfaus. Oh, wow. So you can see that famous picture in uh, the case files of Inspired Ghost Tracking. I think it's, uh, oh, yep, 
It's on page 164. It's it's here. I'm not I'm not going to show you too closely so that you can buy the book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I can, I'll post I, it I, later. Don't worry. I can show it to you later. All right. Yeah. Um, anyway, so I just wanted to talk about Dr. Mudd for a minute because that was another IGT investigation. And um, and Dr. Mudd, uh, I ran into I ran into Dr. Mudd and and I had all kinds of experiences with him. Um, but he kept telling me that he was innocent, and what he was innocent was was of was um, he, they thought he conspired with John Wilkes Booth. Um, so, and he was imprisoned, I believe, wow. for that. Um, and then he got out. Um, but so he still haunts the house. And you, it's a is it a state um, is it a state owned property, Margaret? Do you remember? I can't remember. I think it's more at the Historic Society, I think. Now, um, some of Dr. Mudd's family. Okay. But it, it's somewhere through, like, the Historic Society or something, too. Why do you think he still haunts the house? Like, why hasn't he crossed over? Did he tell you? He, he told me that he wants to set his record straight, that he was not oh. involved with the conspiracy of John Wilkes okay. and the assassination. Yeah. That's what he told me. Rhonda was thinking the same thing as that he wants mm. to prove his innocence. And that's usually what it is. Huh? I'm sorry, Troy. It's usually what it is. Like we've had several experiences where a ghost is still at the house and and when you get right down to it, they're either angry or disgruntled or you know, there's all this stuff, a lot of emotion going on. And in the end, all they want to do is have their story told the truth. And they they want to be you know, exonerated with their family, especially. They don't want the generations of people that they're related to thinking that they were these terrible people when they weren't. And they, until they feel that that story is told properly, you know, they don't leave. Mm -hmm. And there have been some instances where uh, my one of the first experiences I had in West Virginia was uh, in this old house my best friend had. And, I, I was there by myself one night and he showed up in a dream, uh, this guy in, in this house, he's like in his twenties and he sat at the foot of my bed. And in the dream, that was okay. That didn't seem out of the ordinary. I don't know why, but I'm like, hi, who are you? And you know, if I've been awake, I don't know, who the hell are you? Get out. But um, he just sat there and he was talking to me and he told me how he said, yeah, this is my room and this is my house. And I'm like, oh, wow. And he goes, yeah, I died. There was a fire downstairs and smoke filled the whole house. And I never woke up. You know, I died from smoke inhalation. And then I got up and told that story to the my best friend when he showed up the next day, the owner of the house. And he never came back. So there had been a ghost in that house for years that was walking the second floor hallway back and forth. And they would hear him up the stairs and through the hall and making sounds. And I don't from what I understand, he never came back. All he needed was for us just to say, somebody to acknowledge that he was there, that he died, he didn't want it forgotten. And for some reason that was important to him. Hmm. And that was it, and he was released. So maybe one day you'll be able to help Dr. Mudd out a little bit. He's kind of stuck. Maybe yeah, maybe, maybe we can all go back. Uh, yeah. But John Wilkes Booth um, stuck around. And um, as it turned out, when I went in December 2010 to see that the Christmas Carol, John Wilkes Booth made himself known to me. He was actually one of three ghosts. So I call I call that chapter the three ghosts of Christmas past. Um, <laughs> appropriately enough, because we went to see a Christmas carol. Um, so what what happened was I was in the uh, what is now the gift shop, which is on if, if you come in the front door, it's on the left hand side. Um, and I believe that maybe it was in the left hand side. Maybe there was an alleyway there and that gift shop was built out. I don't know. Um, but I think that's where Booth jumped the whole, jumped on the horse and took off. Um, anyway, I was in there and it was I felt cold chills and I and I uh, heard um, a man talk to me and there was nobody around. Um, and he said, um, "This is the site of my proudest moment. This is this is the place of my proudest moment." And he was arrogant and he was a jerk he was a real jerk and and i thought who are you and and he said turn around 
And I, I turned around, and right there was a display of John Wilkes Booth books and pins and all kinds of paraphernalia with his name on it. And I knew it was him. And I thought, well, that certainly fits his personality. Um, I, the next year, by the way, two months before you were there, Troy, in September, my friend Ruth Larkin, <clears throat> also known as the Beantown Medium, who has done a number of presentations for IGT, uh, um, she was visiting us. And we decided we were going to take her on a tour of DC. We went to the Ford's Theater. Um, um, I didn't tell her anything about my encounter with John Wilkes Booth. I had not even put that in print yet because it was going to be in my second book. Um, so we walked into the into the theater and then we went into the gift shop and <clears throat> she came over to me and she said, Rob, do you sense a man here? Uh, and I said, why do you ask? And she said, there's somebody who's really arrogant, who is really a jerk. Um, and who is just just a not a nice person, and and I said, Ruthie, turn around, tell me what you're standing next to. And she was looking. She was standing right next to John Wilkes Booth's yep. display. So we talked to the gift shop people, and they they said that they would find the doors in the gift shop locked from the inside when nobody was there. They they would see the lights go on and off. They would see things move, all kinds of crazy things. So, uh, so he's still there. Um, so Troy, you went in December of 2011. Yeah, and I was there for the same thing, Christmas Carol. Which, by the way, if you haven't seen that a theater, it's amazing. It's hard to get tickets for it. It's so good. But I was in there. I had my uh, spidey senses on the entire time because of the historic you know, nature of the place. And I, I was able to walk. They let me go downstairs through the basement, and there's a museum down there. Mm. And, um, you know, there's a heavy feeling and it's not a good feeling down there, but could be, I think it's for a whole different set of reasons, but I'd gone through there and, uh, came back up and we watched, I think it was, uh, on the way in is when I went and I saw there's a big ramp and I walked in, it's, I'd never been in this building before and over to the left is the gift shop. So. I walked over into the gift shop. I'm just kind of tooling around, looking at all the different things, thinking, yeah, I'm not going to have a, a Lincoln cup or a John Wilkes Booth cup or pen in my house. I don't need that. So <laughs> kind of looked around for the t-shirt and whatever. And uh, then I got to, it was near the, like when you walk in, there's like a big opening and then you walk into the gift shop. It's not that big. Yeah. All the way to the back. Yes. And there's a bookshelf there. And then there's a you know wall that, I think the other side you said is the alley and you texted it was right there. there yeah right? i did i i it was overwhelming there was this really angry energy that you described that just the more you tuned in the stronger it got and it's almost like he wants his story to be told i think he thinks he was right i don't know i don't know what's going on in the ghost's mind and um and it was arrogant and it was really uh, I'm really uncomfortable. And so I texted Rob, like, Rob, I'm here. And this is where it is. It's in this spot. And you were confirming the whole thing. Like, you didn't tell me exactly where to go or any of that stuff. Yeah, you didn't so, actually. So uh, I, I told you to turn around and, and I said, uh, look around you and you'll be able to figure out who that is. Yeah. Yeah. And then it was pretty quick. I thought, no, it's not going to be that person. I even walked and it was. And I, and I walked uh, <laughs> later. I took a walk down down the alley. And you can feel the residual energy of sorts there, like where, where all that happened because of the urgency of it and, <clears throat> and all the energy of, of the place. And it just so happens that Jeff, my other half, used to work in the building next to the Ford's Theater. His oh. office on the other side of the, his wall was the booth where, where Lincoln was shot, just on the other side of his office wall. And so when I would go into his office, I would think, can I, can I, I really did, I didn't sense anything there. Had I not known, that was what was next door. I would never have picked that up because it just didn't. The residual energy, surprisingly enough, you know, wasn't there uh, in that wall. But I would imagine if I walked into the booth where it happened, we would feel it. You know, unless sometimes have there been like a thousand psychics and mediums and intuitives that have gone through a place, you know, the energy is scrambled all to hell by the time mm -hmm. 
you ever get there and that's probably what's going on there but i doubt people went to the gift shop to try to find john wilkes booth so maybe that's why we were able to pick it up there and it didn't get scrambled yet i have read one report online that said that they they they've been reports of john wilkes booth's ghost on stage uh, and uh whenever the a, a dark shadow is seen and people think it's john wilkes booth the actors typically stumble over their lines so oh, okay so that may be uh, margaret have you ever been there no i have not okay well that, that would be a great igt trip one year we should all go to the watch play together right yeah but we're not going in the gift shop so. <laughs> no, I don't want to, I don't want that energy. So anyway, I see that we only have five minutes left in in our Christmas program. So That's crazy. Um, I know. So so there were two other ghosts in there. One was an actress, and uh, <clears throat> another one was a, a gentleman. I didn't even get his name, but you can read about that in the Lessons Learned from Talking to the Dead uh, book because it has Troy's experience and my experience and Ruth's experience um, that all tie into that. Um, so with that. I'd like to take the last five minutes and go around and um, get what get your your feelings about Christmas or anything you want to say about Christmas to everybody that's kind enough to watch us for an hour. So we'll start with Margaret. Oh, get my feelings on it. Um, Christmas to me is just always been family and friends and you know get togethers. Um, I hope everybody has a Merry Christmas. Um, stay safe. You know, you got COVID, COVID and we're trying to keep us away from everybody. So stay safe, keep your group small, and I um, guess we'll see you in the new year. Yeah, and uh, you know, I, I just, there's so much going on these days and it's been really hard. This year has been a nightmare for so many of us in so many ways. And um, I, I do feel a shift, you know, I know that the vaccines are coming out and things will turn and change. It's gonna take several months and we have to be really careful and safe right now because you wanna be around and be alive by the, in, in order to get the vaccine so that we can all get through this. I'd hate to get this far into it and then mess up and get sloppy. and. Mm -hmm. not be you know we have some missing loved ones next year at christmas i want them all to be there the ones that are here now i want them to be there then so um yeah we're going to keep it small we're going to keep it you know simple and nice and there's there's some beauty to that i mean when you think about it um military people especially and people that join peace corps and all the different things that happen miss two and three and four and five christmases sometimes in a row and they're far far away from people they feel isolated mm -hmm. and alone but they get through it you know, they, they're able to connect and they talk. There's, if anything, if absence does make the heart grow fonder and talk about an awesome time next Christmas. I'm looking forward to that. I don't know that I better start saving up money because I'm going to be traveling all over the place, meeting and talking to people and, and all of it. But I'm excited. I think it's a special year. Uh, we have the great conjunction happening uh, what, on the 21st, Rob. Um, um, with, uh, Saturn and Jupiter, I think, coming together. Yes. And so mm -hmm. I saw some stuff on some of the uh, science sites and NASA sites and all that about it, which is planetary alignment of sorts that's happening. It's going to look really pretty bright. And there are a lot of people, oh my gosh, I've been seeing tons of stuff about what the energy is going to shift and change and whatever. But I don't know if any of that's true. But what I do feel is I do feel a very positive thing for this coming year. I do feel like some really good vibes the upcoming year i think a bunch of old things that had to be broken off of us are only broken off through crisis uh there are certain levels that and stages of development that we only get to when you get a good kick in the pants and you have to go through a crisis uh, to get to it i think many of us are going to be experiencing that now on lots of levels especially those of you who've lost people that you love uh, this year due to COVID. so it is not all for naught i mean there's purpose to everything uh and it's going to be guided i think it's going to be a good year but with that, I want to wish everybody Happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, and every other thing you want to celebrate that makes you happy. Uh, where our hearts are there with you. Awesome, uh, and I echo uh, your sentiments too. Um, I, I just want to let everybody know that Christmas is, although it may be a holiday, 
um, and you can look at it a lot, in a lot of different ways. Christmas is really in the heart, and it should be really about love and caring about each other every day of the year. And that's what spirits want us to do. They also want us to know that they truly are around us around the holidays, and they're watching out for us, whether they are people or whether they are pets. And with that, um, I just want to say thank you very much for joining us tonight, and um, <clears throat> let everybody know um, that they can play this on Christmas Eve, and that way they get their Christmas ghost stories. So <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah. All right, and keep keep alert because if you get a good story, let us know. We'll tell it. <laughs> That'd be yeah. awesome. Sounds great. All right. Well, good night, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Good seeing you all. You too. Bye.